Thanks, Abrams, for the introduction. So, um, as Abrams said, um, I work for ODI and the Centre for Tax Analysis in Developing Countries. Um, as an advisor to the Ministry of Finance in, in Uganda. But um, this paper is some research that I did jointly with Abrams um, and Michael Danko, also of um, uh, UNU Wider, a couple of years ago, um, attempting to sort of re revisit or have another look at um, tax effort scores, of which there'd been um, a reasonable amount um, published in the preceding years. And so the, the sort of motivation for why we, why we sort of delved into looking at this topic um, basically came from a concern over the, some of the estimation methods employed in existing tax effort studies and the sort of sense that some of those might be, might be slightly, slightly biased for one reason or the other. Um, so the, the, the work that we do doesn't necessarily reinvent the wheel. Um, we revisit some existing approaches, but we perhaps put a new tire on that wheel um, and add some new kind of points to, to that in, in the sense of um, employing a longer time series of data, slight, slight improvements to the methodologies, and we, we, we essentially, we think that we find that prior approaches to estimating tax effort have underestimated those scores um, and been subject to biases from outlying observations that go into that model. Um, and that, that carries some sort of potentially important implications for the takeaways and the kind of policy interpretation of, of that work. Um, so I'm gonna try and talk through, I'll, I'll slightly break Abram's rule of not being super technical, but I'll, I, I'll, I'll talk through some of the, the approaches that we do in as general terms as I can, but then focus on what that means for our understanding of, of you know, what you see in a tax effort score. Um, so just so that we're all on the same page, when, we, when I refer to tax effort in this, in this context, essentially, as Abrams has said, that's, that, that's an, uh, attempting to estimate the ratio of actual tax collected to some potential tax collected in a given country time period. Um, of course, the challenge at hand is notwithstanding the challenges in measuring actual taxes collected in some countries, but the bigger challenge at hand for this sort of exercise is to ask how we best estimate potential taxes collected given what we know about economies and societies in various countries. Um, but these figures of tax effort are often cited in donor reports, advisory reports, you see them in various research places, uh, research reports as well, um, and can often be used as evidence to encourage low and middle income countries um, to improve their tax collection. And so where those figures find their way into that sort of policy dialogue, we felt that um, it was important, obviously, that those are, as I put in inverted commas, accurately estimated as possible, and then any sort of advice that might be in some part based on those scores or figures is grounded in sort of fairly realistic expectations of where countries might see themselves getting to at some point, given their underlying characteristics. Um, there are many sort of limitations um, around tax effort estimation, um, some of which I'll mention at the very end. Um, so very briefly, um, the, to, to sort of go through the, the, the history of this exercise of trying to understand tax effort since at least the late 1950s, that there's been a fairly rich literature which has attempted in an empirical setting to, to estimate the determinants of countries' tax ratios across country. Um, traditionally or initially, this was done according to an OLS in an OLS framework or a fixed effects regression of a country's tax ratio on a set of economic variables such as the level of income, um, how open to international trade um, a country is, the structure of the economy and maybe some indicator of whether that country has natural resource wealth which would be perhaps a boost to revenue collections. Um, over time, studies came to increasingly attempt to understand the sort of mediating role of those factors played by perhaps demographic or socioeconomic characteristics such as how urban is the country, um, um, what are the sort of perceptions of corruption in that country, what kind of government is in place, um, and how that might affect um, taxes collected across countries. Um, but more recently, and where we sort of enter into this debate is that studies have moved to estimating um, tax effort according to stochastic frontier analysis. Um, I should sort of caveat that of the three of us on the paper, neither Abrams nor I were the geniuses behind the stochastic frontier modeling. Unfortunately, our, our third author is not in the room with us today. Um, but um, essentially, um, the stochastic frontier studies um, started to emerge in the tax effort literature around about um, 2010, 2013 with some IMF working papers and have been built on um, a few times since then um, in the reference studies um, that I've written on the screen there. Um, and this essentially models tax collection as a sort of production function whereby the inputs are those sort of underlying economic um, and social characteristics. And then they, they, the model 
um, estimates a sort of tax frontier or a sort of modelled maximum amount of tax that a country could collect given the inputs that go into that model. Um, and essentially, in this sort of model, um, the difference between actual taxes collected in a given country and a sort of theoretical amount or a modelled amount, the difference is broken into um, a random error term and an inefficiency component. Um, I drew this very basic graph in PowerPoint yesterday, so forgive my artistic skills, but essentially, um, in trying to model this in the most accurate way, we're attempting to hone in as accurately as possible on that inefficiency component and ensure that the sort of random error doesn't creep into what we're actually um, estimating. So what do we do? Again, I'm giving a fairly rushed or brief overview of, of what ended up being quite a technical exercise. Um, but we, we estimate the stochastic tax frontier according to four different um, models, or we should say our co-author estimates them according to four different models. Uh, the pooled model, random effects model, Batis and Coeli model, um, and the true random effects approach. Um, and following this estimation, we compute scores of tax effort. Um, and so for as far as we know, our paper was the first to employ the fourth um, method methodology there, the, the true random effects approach. And we, we think that that, that that represents a bit of an advancement in our understanding of how to estimate tax effort. Um, so what we did is we estimated, according to these four approaches, um, the first three have been used at various points in previous uh, papers. Um, and the key question was basically, well, which is actually the best way to model this? Um, and so the, 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 the next slide is going to show you, after this exercise, the distribution of all of the scores that came out for our model for 160 countries between about 1980 and 2019, the distribution of all those scores according to those four different methods. Um, hopefully that's not too small or blurry on the screen there, but um, from left to right, top to bottom, that goes um, the pooled model, the random effects model, the batis Coeli model, and the true random effects model. Um, and so just focusing on the two at the bottom, firstly, um, the one on the bottom left corner is the, the methodology that's been used in quite a lot of literature up until now. And you can see that the estimates of tax effort scores range, like, are quite broad. The median is around about, I think, 0 0.35, 0 0.37. Um, but the true random effects approach seems to stand out um, from the others as, being, as having quite a tight variance and being skewed a lot further um, to the higher end of the scale with a median at about 0 0.83 or 0 0.84. Um, and so, um, essentially, we, we find that, that in the course of the modeling that the true random effects model is actually better able to disentangle that inefficiency component from the random noise um, in the model. Um, and the, the, the previous approaches that had been employed don't actually seem to be able to do this to as great an extent. And thus, some time invariant heterogeneity ends up being attributed to inefficiency, which isn't actually what we want to measure, because then you end up with a bigger inefficiency score, and it looks like a given country in a given year is not doing as well as it could be at collecting tax revenue. Um, but um, in fact, that they weren't being um, modeled particularly um, accurately. Um, and so we, we find this as a substantive limitation of some of the approaches that had been used before. So. In terms of a very, very broad overview of, of, of the sort of scores that come out of our models, so we, we find that like globally on average, countries are collecting around about 84% of what our model predicts they could be collecting, um, given the underlying characteristics that go into that model. Um, to put that in context with a couple of recent studies, um, one from 2016, um, using one of the prior approaches um, that I talked about, estimates on average a tax effort of about 0 0.64 globally, um, and um, I think annually the USAID have a project called the Collecting Taxes Database, uh, data set, I think, and they, um, they estimate tax effort according to those older approaches as well and find out that on average tax effort globally is around about 0 0.51, suggesting that on average countries, given their underlying characteristics, are collecting just about half of the tax revenue that they could be. Um, and sort of just to, to plot these, um, so all of the observations we were able to match for each country year of our own approach um, versus the, 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 um, the scores that come from the USAID's collecting taxes database um, are plotted there. And so you see again um, on the y-axis a much, a much sort of larger spread of scores and um, ranging from anywhere from zero to, to, to as much as one, or in some cases above one actually. Um, so that's just putting in context the sort of differences of what's coming out of the different models. Um, so notwithstanding um, 
that we see that the, the approach that we take comes up with a slightly different uh, set of scores. Um, and what, what we also did, uh, very quickly give an example, is we, we looked at, okay, well, what might be causing that bias? What might be causing the fact that in these other approaches, some countries are scoring like 99% or 31% or 20%. Um, and when we, looked at, when we looked at the input data, what we find is that um, the previous approaches were being biased by outlying observations of input data. So a very quick, under, a very quick example is Slovakia, um, which collects about 20% of GDP in tax, re, in tax revenue, um, not particularly high or particularly low. Um, but the estimate of tax effort using the Bates Coeli specification is about 0 0.36. So that suggests that Slovakia is collecting only about 36% of the tax revenue that it could be. We find that actually it's collecting somewhere closer to about 85%. Um, but when we looked at the input variables to try and understand what's causing this, um, we see that trade as a percent of GDP, one of our key economic input variables, has a really, really high figure for Slovakia. It's over 200% for the most recent year. Um, and it's one of the highest ranked um, in the world. Um, we find a similar story for other countries where you had input variables with very high or very low um, values um, seem to be skewing those, those estimates. And these are just sort of like little anecdotal examples, but we did see that across, um, across countries. Um, so let me, let me just sort of try and tie what all of this kind of means together. Um, again, it was a very sort of quick run through what ended up being quite a technical exercise. Um, we think our results suggest that recent estimates um, using stochastic frontier analysis of tax effort have perhaps been real substantial underestimates. And we think this is due to sensitivity to outlying observations and the methodology that's being employed. Um, and ultimately, where these scores enter policy dialogues, this can be a bit misleading. To go to a country and say, you're only collecting 30% of what our model thinks you can collect, is very different from going to a country and saying, well, you're collecting about 80, 85% of what we think you can collect. Um, those, those, those can be interpreted in two sort of very different um, ways. Um, but I said, I wanted to also just discuss finally about um, the use of these tax effort scores. Um, it's a very interesting academic exercise and a potentially very useful piece of evidence, um, but I definitely wouldn't ever recommend that these are kind of solely relied upon as a diagnostic tool for, for, suggesting, for suggesting targets or anything like that for revenue collection for a, a given country. Um, they're very high level. Um, I think they're um, a useful piece of diagnostic evidence. Um, that can play complement to others and um, that can be used to build a more complete picture of where countries are and where they might hope to, to go um, in the future. So other, um, other things might be things like tax expenditure analysis, which we heard a bit about this morning, um, losses from initial financial flows, other analyses like VATCAP or income tax analysis um, can also be very useful tools. Um, and just finally, it's worth saying that a tax effort score in a low-income country should probably be interpreted very differently to a tax effort score in a high income country. At some point along the sort of chain of, of growth or development, um, the amount of tax collected, uh, 10 seconds left, the amount of tax collected essentially becomes a societal choice of what kind of party you've voted for and whether they're a low tax or a high tax party. But I think it's probably fair to say that most low and middle income countries would just like to collect a lot more tax revenue to fund their development spending. So interpreting a score of 0 0.85 for Malawi or Sierra Leone might be a very different interpretation to a score of 0 0.85 for Norway or for Sweden. Um, thank you and apologies for going over time.